Grignard reagents are among the most important reagents that you will encounter in your study of organic chemistry. A Grignard reagent, by definition, is a compound with a carbon-magnesium bond. So indicated here is the phenyl Grignard reagent, also known as phenyl magnesium bromide. And as you can see, it has a carbon-magnesium bond, the magnesium also usually being bound to a halogen. Grignard reagents were discovered by French chemist Victor Grignard in 1900, and he won the 1912 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery. So the carbon-magnesium bond is highly polarized carbon minus magnesium plus because of the large electronegativity difference between magnesium and carbon. Magnesium has an electronegativity of 1.2, and carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. So carbon acts like it has a negative charge, and it is therefore nucleophilic. So the Grignard reagent is our answer for a general carbon nucleophile. So how are Grignard reagents formed? Well, the answer is that you take an alkyl or aryl halide, in this case, if we want to make the phenyl magnesium bromide, we'll start with bromobenzene and react it with magnesium metal in ether, some sort of ether, depicted here as diethyl ether, but there are other ethers that are sometimes used as the solvent. So the reaction literally takes place on the surface of the magnesium metal. So when, if you're doing this in the laboratory, you can take little pieces of magnesium, put them into the reaction, and once the reaction happens, the magnesium metal is just going to disappear into the solvent as the soluble Grignard reagent is formed out of the insoluble magnesium metal. So we're not going to be concerned with the mechanism of how Grignard reagents are formed. That mechanism involves radicals, but the best way to think about it is just take the magnesium atom and insert it into the carbon-bromine bond, and that will give you the Grignard reagent. Okay, a note about the solvent. The reason why you need ether of some sort as a solvent is because it is an aprotic donor solvent. Okay, aprotic means no acidic hydrogens, and we'll talk about why that's important on the next slide. And donor means that it has at least one lone pair on it. Ethers have two lone pairs, because what they need to do is actually coordinate to the magnesium. As depicted, the Grignard reagent has magnesium forming two bonds and only has four electrons around it. The role of the ether, you will, you will generally bind two ethers to the magnesium of a Grignard reagent to allow magnesium to have eight electrons around it in a Lewis acid, Lewis base interaction. Without the ether, the magnesium is going to be strongly Lewis acidic and it's not going to want to become the Grignard reagent. Okay, so now we're going to get into the reactions of Grignard reagents. So to start with, I'm going to tell you what we don't want Grignard reagents to do, but what they will do inevitably if we are not careful with them. And that is the undesired reaction with proton sources. Okay, so Grignard reagents are strong bases. They can be thought of as the tamed down version of C- minus of a carbanion. The conjugate acid pKa's are frequently 40 or higher. They will react as a Bronsted base with any functional group that contains an acidic hydrogen to generate an alkane. Okay, so depicted here is butyl magnesium bromide reacting with water to give butane in a simple acid-base reaction plus MgBrOH as the inorganic byproduct. This is not the mode of reactivity we want. So as a result, the following functional groups are not compatible with Grignard reagents. Alcohols, carboxylic acids, water, and this includes anywhere in the reaction mixture. So it could be in the solvent, 
in, as an impurity in one of the reagents, as well as being one of the components of your molecular structure. And finally, terminal alkynes. You remember those are acidic also, and they can have their acidic hydrogen removed by strong base. So if Grignard reagents are a carbon nucleophile, what we're going to go through now is look at the reactions that it could undergo with the three classes of carbon electrophiles that we have introduced so far. And we will start with alkyl halides. And this reaction, quite frankly, is just not a very good reaction. So if, if we took isopropyl magnesium bromide and reacted it with propyl bromide, okay, this is a primary alkyl halide, you know, the one that you think would work the best, you could get some substitution product, okay? So again, the color code tells you which atoms are coming from which reagent. The three atoms in purple are coming from the Grignard, the three atoms in blue are coming from the alkyl halide, and then red is the new carbon-carbon bond. So you will get some amount of substitution product. I'm not saying it will be a total failure with a primary. But even with a primary, the major products are going to be elimination. Okay, so you get propane from the isopropyl magnesium bromide acting as a base and propene coming from the propyl bromide losing a hydrogen, losing HBr total to form the alkene. So elimination will be the exclusive product with secondary alkyl halides, will frequently be the major product with primary. The one exception in which you can do this would be in, in high yield, would be with a methyl halide because there are no beta hydrogens to remove, so elimination is not a possibility. Okay, so if this is not a good reaction, what is a good reaction? Why are Grignard reagents so important? Well, a truly excellent reaction is the reaction of Grignard reagents with carbonyl groups. Okay, so in this case, we're going to take our isopropyl magnesium bromide and react it with acetone. We're going to do this in ether as a solvent. That's the number one ether above the arrow. And then after the reaction has gone to completion, we add a proton source in the aqueous workup. H plus and H2O. That's why there's a number two next to that below the arrow. And the product now is going to be a six carbon tertiary alcohol. So mechanistically, the carbon bound to magnesium attacks the carbonyl carbon. This will break the CO pi bond and generate an alcohol. Once again, the Ketone-derived pieces are in blue, the Grignard-derived pieces are in purple, and the new carbon-carbon bond is in red. I would now like to go through the detailed mechanism of this reaction. So what happens first is that the two molecules will approach each other, but because they are both polarized, they're going to approach each other such that their oppositely polarized ends are next to each other. So the carbonyl group is polarized C plus O minus. The Grignard reagent is polarized Mg plus C minus. So the partial negative carbon of the Grignard is next to the partial positive carbon of the carbonyl. The partial negative oxygen of the carbonyl is next to the partial positive magnesium of the Grignard reagent. So once they approach each other, then the electrons can start to dance. So we start with a curved arrow going from the carbon-magnesium bond. Those electrons go and attack the carbonyl carbon. And then at the same time, we need another arrow breaking the carbon-oxygen pi bond and using those electrons to form an oxygen-magnesium bond. So after these arrows, we end up with an intermediate that looks like this. We have formed our new carbon-carbon bond but instead of having a strict O minus, we still have MgBr covalently bound to the oxygen. Mg is just is in group two rather than group one. If this were sodium, it would be a true pair of ions and a plus O minus. But because it's magnesium, they're getting a little bit closer to each other on the periodic table. 
we typically draw this as a covalent bond. If you drew this as an O minus, if you put the electrons onto the oxygen, I probably wouldn't mark it wrong, but for the purposes of this presentation, I want to give you the rigorous way to draw this. So then all we have to do is replace the MGBR with a hydrogen, and that comes from the water that is added in the workup. So we need one arrow going from the oxygen-magnesium bond to the hydrogen, and then a second arrow breaking the HOH bond, giving us hydroxide. So our final product is the alcohol. Okay, so just a summary of how Grignards react with different carbonyl groups. So as we have seen, if the Grignard is reacting with a ketone, the product is a tertiary alcohol. If the Grignard reacts with an aldehyde, the product is a secondary alcohol, as depicted on the right, isopropyl Grignard plus acetaldehyde now gives us a 5-carbon secondary alcohol. And then finally, if the Grignard reagent reacts with formaldehyde, the product is a primary alcohol. So the 3-carbon isopropyl Grignard reacting with 1-carbon formaldehyde gives us a 4-carbon primary alcohol. The other excellent reaction of Grignard reagents is their reaction with epoxides. So as you can see in this case, a four carbon epoxide plus a three carbon isopropyl Grignard reagent react together in ether. They are then subjected to the aqueous workup and you get a seven carbon, in this case, tertiary alcohol. Note which carbons come from the epoxide and the new carbon-carbon bond in red, and then the three carbons that come from the green reagent. Note that the new carbon-carbon bond now is one carbon away from the carbon containing the OH in the product. If you add a Grignard reagent to a carbonyl group, the new carbon-carbon bond is formed to the carbon that has the OH on it in the product. With an epoxide, you're forming a carbon-carbon bond one carbon further away. So these two different modes of reactivity will become useful in a subsequent lesson when we start applying this reaction to synthesis problems. Okay, I'm going to go over the detailed mechanism of this reaction. Also, it is not that different from the carbonyl addition reaction, except instead of breaking the CO pi bond, we are breaking one of the CO bonds to open up the epoxide ring and relieve that angle strain. So again, the epoxide with a CO bond that's polarized C plus O minus is going to line up next to the Grignard reagent with its bond polarized C minus Mg plus. We have the arrow going from the carbon-magnesium bond to the carbon of the epoxide that gets attacked. A second arrow from the carbon-oxygen bonding electrons to the magnesium, which now gives us a similar intermediate in which we have formed our new carbon-carbon bond and have an oxygen-magnesium covalent bond, just like on the last slide. Then finally, we add our water in the aqueous workup to give the final alcohol product. And it needs the usual two arrows, one from the oxygen-magnesium bond to the hydrogen, forming the OH bond, and then a second arrow breaking the OH bond in water and putting those electrons onto the oxygen to generate hydroxide. Okay, a couple of notes. Grignard reagents are strong bases, so we are using the basic mechanism for epoxide ring opening. And with an unsymmetrical epoxide, we are attacking the less substituted carbon, the one that has no extra substituent groups on it. Okay, so that's how Grignard reagents work, how they're formed, and their useful reactions with carbonyl groups and epoxides, as well as their, how they can get destroyed by being reacted with a proton source. In the next lesson, we will start to explore how Grignard rea reactions can be used to solve synthesis problems.